Mr. Emmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again to the witnesses uh, for being here today. Uh, I come from a state, Minnesota, that uh, one of the two major drivers of our private economy is agriculture. And uh, it's always about finding <laughs> markets, uh, not just in the United States, but beyond our borders. And uh, when it comes to Cuba, when the exception was made uh, more than a decade ago, Minnesota was one of the first to uh, send a delegation to Cuba and open up the relationship. It's important uh, to our state when we're talking about uh, uh, export markets and growing uh, trade opportunities. Uh, and I think it was Mr. Karsting who said uh, earlier, who testified that uh, lifting the embargo would help farmers in general. It would help all farmers. And uh, I guess I want to go from there. What sectors, uh, if you will, and whoever has the expertise or all of you, what sectors uh, in our agricultural uh, industry in this country are hurt most by the U.S. trade embargo? I think we've seen uh, losses in wheat and rice, and you could go uh, down the laundry list of, of bulk commodities and look at who's gone up and who's gone down over time, and and uh, that'd be sort of a rough way to, to look at it. But I think wheat and, uh, and rice are two of the principal ones. Poultry uh, exports remain pretty strong. But in general, what we've seen since, you know, from 2005 compared to uh, today, you know, Cuba used to buy a much uh, greater variety of goods, and now that, that variety of goods uh, has been diminished. There's also been a fundamental shift in U.S. agricultural exports in the last decade or two. Uh, we sell a lot more process and intermediate intermediary products products uh, these days than we did a decade or two ago. So um, there's probably potential opportunity in each one of those categories. It's hard for me to say exactly which one is going to be, uh, uh, you know, which one is going to shine. Ask me in 10 years, and maybe we'll have some some good uh, uh, some good numbers on that. What uh are there anything, and maybe, again, I don't know which one of you this is most appropriate for, but we've talked about what the, or you've testified to what the administration has done. Uh, there might be an argument if they're within their, uh, their authority or not. But is there more that can still be done, you believe, without congressional uh, action to open up uh, the Cuban marketplace? I think the authority within my agency, uh, you know, where we, where we would go now uh, does require action uh, by Congress. Our principal export promotion programs that I've mentioned before, uh, we can't use those. We can't spend a single dollar on any sort of export promotion. So, um, you know, we would love to uh, be in an environment where we have uh, a little more um, in the gr on the ground intelligence in country. Uh, and when I say intelligence, I mean I don't m I, I mean our, our ag attaches, those sorts of things at some point. Uh, we currently uh, run all of our Caribbean operations out of an office in Miami. Um, so we will see what that, uh, uh, you know, take it one step at a time. Uh, Mr. Smith, you were talking about uh, some of the things that have been done through this uh, administration's actions, including broadening the ability of financial institutions to do more. And I think uh, uh, the gentlelady from Florida was referring to debit cards, et cetera. You had referred to uh, U.S. banks, financial institutions can now uh, have correspondent uh, uh, relationships in Cuba. How many of those uh, exist at this moment, has that started already? To my knowledge, there's only one financial institution that's open to correspond an account in Cuba. I think the when you have uh, Cuba is one of our toughest sanctions programs. The variety of uh, requirements that we have under our sanctions and the penalties that we impose for violations, and um, most people are aware of the major penalties that we've uh, instituted when we find that a financial institution has run afoul of our sanctions lead banks to be very, very cautious. And so I, I think if you ask me what my expectation would be, is that until there is a greater um, interest for the bank, until there is more trade or con, uh, interest from big American companies, you'll have banks that are very cautious about getting in until the profit is greater for them. Wow, but taking that one step farther, uh, it's, it's not just that, but isn't it true that with the embargo still in place, uh, they don't. Uh, it, there isn't going to be a rush uh, of banks, financial institutions uh, entering into Cuba. I, I think that's right. We, as as I said at the beginning, most the way that even with these changes, 
most imports, most exports, and most other transactions remain prohibited between the United States and Cuba. Given that landscape, um, there is not that great of an incentive for financial institutions to rush in across the board. Uh, lastly, could you expand on your testimony earlier that uh, you said the administration, uh, through its actions, have expanded certain humanitarian projects in Cuba? Sure, can you we expand on that. Sure, we issued a general license. That's a regulatory authorization that allows U.S. persons uh, to provide uh, certain, uh, to do certain activities within what we define as the humanitarian field. Um, within the humanitarian field, we define what we mean by that. So it may be certain medical or educational or other types of projects, including certain microfinancing type activities. And we also authorize in that area. Um, more remittances in an unlimited category where we might have restrictions in other categories. So we've been working in that area. We also allow travel for that purpose as well. I, and I think lastly, with what little time I might have left, Mr. Carson, you were talking about the farmer to farmer programs. Can you, uh, for people that are here, can you uh, tell us how do those work? We do a number of sort of educational exchange programs, and, and uh, a farmer to farmer can be one of them. Uh, often when we send uh, trade missions overseas, U.S. producers will go and accompany uh, their sales executives, and that turns into a de facto farmer to farmer exchange. We also have two other programs that we administer. There's the uh, uh, Normandy Borlaug Exchange Program and the, and the Cochrane Exchange Program. Uh, the Borlaug relates more to um, uh, graduate level PhD research exchanges. Uh, the Cochrane program uh, deals with a lot of very practical on the ground, sort of this is the way you manage uh, cold uh, supply chain, um, uh, you know, any number of sorts of things. So we do exchange programs uh, around the globe, but obviously not with Cuba unless there's a change in the law. And, okay, thank you. I yield back. 